What a win for Max Verstappen and what a recovery for Sergio Perez. And what a podium for Carlos Sainz. Now we know who's quick, who's close, and who's got work to do for the next race in Saudi Arabia, which is a totally different track where things could be very different. Welcome everyone to F1 Nation. The Dutch driver continues his domination of Formula One. New year, but no new winner. Max Verstappen still the driver to beat. Max Verstappen wins the season opener. He takes the Bahrain Grand Prix. That was simply lovely. What a great race. Great start to the year, guys. One, two as well, so absolutely fantastic. Hi there and welcome to the paddock in Bahrain. It's me, Tom Clarkson, the 1996 world champion, Damon Hill. I was glad you said you're Damon Hill because I thought you were claiming you were 1996 <laughs> world champion, which you're not, obviously. Chance would be a fine thing. And joining us in a little while, we have Argentine journalist Juan Fossaroli from ESPN Latin America as well. But Damon and I are sat at Red Bull Racing after what has been a hugely dominant weekend, Damon. How surprised were you? Well, I think I was a little bit surprised. I mean, I, w when I saw the testing, I, I thought Red Bull were going to be dominant. And then people closed up and it did look like it was going to be quite tight. Qualifying was reasonably close. In actual fact, an odd thing happened. Um, <laughs> Max was on pole position, even though he wasn't the fastest person in qualifying, which is Charles Leclerc. But that was in uh, Q2, not in Q3, which is the one that counts. Hang on, we're not comparing apples and apples, though, are we? In that the conditions changed, the wind changed sure. for Q3. Yeah, and but things, in but the hour of qualifying, yes, well, yeah, the quickest is. car was actually Charles Leclerc. But he had a mare of a race. Uh, but we'll get into that probably at some point. And Juan, straight from, I guess, the TV interview pen, has joined us now. Uh, were you surprised by Red Bull's dominance? Hello, Tom. Hello, Damon. Uh, I cannot say that I'm surprised, but I thought it was going to be a little bit more, I don't know, close, maybe. Not that big gap, even with Checo. Even Checo on the pen told us that he has some issues they have to manage, and that's why it's a 22 seconds gap between them. But uh, I was expecting a little bit more about the rivals of Red Bull. Well, let's deal with Red Bull first of all. And we're going to hear from race winner Max Verstappen and second place Sergio Perez right now. I think today was probably better than expected. Um, the thing that changed was the wind and the intensity of it. So I just had a better feeling with the car and I could look after my tires quite well in, at the same time. So uh, that was very positive. Probably a bit more how it was in testing as well. I just felt very comfortable with the car and uh, yeah, that, that really showed today. So, uh, yeah, very happy to, to kickstart the season like this, but also as a team, you know, to have a 1-2 is just fantastic. But I also think that in general, other teams are closer. I just think that today everything just worked really, really well. And I, of course, don't expect that to happen every single uh, Grand Prix in the near future. So we take it, we, we look back at it, of course, we analyze it, and we'll try to improve further. Well. Let's throw it forward to the next race. How much confidence do you have going into Saudi Arabia? Yeah, it's a completely different track layout. A lot more high-speed corners. Uh, the tarmac, of course, completely different to what it is here. So less degradation. Naturally, probably that will help other teams as well uh, compared to us. Uh, it seems like for us always it's better to have these kind of tracks. Um, so I don't expect that to be easy. All right. Well, look, very well done today. Thank you, Max. Checo coming to you. Great race from fifth on the grid. Just how satisfied are you with your progress? Yeah, I think starting from P5, uh, it's always nice to make good progress. There was a, a lot of battles on track, which around this place is uh, just going to a very different strategy once that happens. You know, you are sliding a lot more on traffic. And um, I think overall, it's a very good team result, you know. Um, he was quite quite close with the uh, with the Ferraris, with uh, with the Mercs early on. We were fighting with the with the DRS, obviously being uh, a lap earlier. It just uh, changes a few things out there. How comfortable are you in the RB20? Yeah, I think today was a very nice surprise. We were expecting the people around us to to be a lot stronger. This is probably the worst place for degradation. So I think the better it is, the, the closer it will get. So yeah, that will be a very different challenge. So it will be interesting to, to see where we are there. Damon, I feel that he was cruising for most of that race, Max was. Would you agree? I think he felt like he was cruising. 
<laughs> I think I think Checker was probably trying to catch him, but not getting anywhere near. And and definitely it was well managed. It was is well under control from the very almost the first few corners. Um, got a little bit of a threat there from behind, but not not enough really to worry about. So he he managed that race beautifully, and he seemed hardly puffed at all at the end, didn't he? Really, I mean it was it was too easy. He actually said uh, in the press conference afterwards that. Uh, the, this year's car has a pretty similar feeling to last year's, only a bit better. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. So, well, I mean, this is this is a gla- grand slam. You were explaining to me. I, I thought grand slam was just pole position, fastest lap, and win the race. But actually, it's leading every lap uh, is, is the grand slam, and he's one of only he's fifth on that scale or something like that. So, another st- statistic added to his incredible tally was it 55 Grand Prix victories now? I mean, he's only 26 and. 18 of the last 19 races. Astonishing statistics, you know, and it, it keeps coming. But uh, where is the challenge going to come from? Somebody has to stop him. They can't. These things can't last forever. We we want to, we want to see some racing at the sharp end. Damon, let's bring in our South American correspondent to discuss that. Right, if the RB20 is as dominant as it looked today. Now I know this track lends itself to a car like that because it's rear limited. It's an abrasive surface, and it really looks after its tires. Has Checo got what it takes this year? Are you seeing a different Checo? I am seeing a different Checo, and uh, he has to believe that. And I think he's believing that. He has to believe in himself and then see how he can cope with the car. You know, the engineering, he has already been three years with Hugh and Bird, and I think now they're getting a little bit more in connection. Um, Max with Gian Piero, they've been here for ages. And also, Checo, um, if this car is, he's mentioned in the pen to us that this is car is very similar to last year, but they have to do a little tweaks, you know, and set up. And I think maybe we're going to Jeddah, where he had two poles and a win from last year, and he feels very, very strong in that track. If in that track, Checo cannot fight for the win and Max gives a big advantage, maybe we're going to see a different story, but I think he's hoping for that. If Max dominates in Jeddah, which we think is a Checo type track, that's going to be a sort of double whammy, a double blow for Checo, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's why. I mean, he's expecting to perform very well on Jeddah. Let's see what happens next week. Um, I ask Max, uh, oh, you're, you're very serious. You're not like enjoy, you know, the Grand Chalem, the Grand Slam. And he say, well, I'm very focused because this is a long championship and I think we overperform and some teams underperform, you know, they maybe don't, they didn't get it right for this strike. And maybe it's, I don't think, well, Damon more, knows more, but I don't think it's, this car is going to be track dependent, but another car yes, and maybe they're going to, the fight is going to be a little bit tighter, not that big gap between, I don't know, Mercedes 46 seconds is ridiculous. No? Can you remember how you felt, Damon? after the first race of 1996 in Melbourne. Williams had dominated. I'm guessing that's the vibe that is permeating through Red Bull right now. Well, we had a little bit of a race in that particular one. I, I had Jack who qualified on pole and Jack Villeneuve and uh, I was, I had a watching brief of him during the race. So I was sitting on his gearbox watching, seeing what he was doing, seeing for a, a safe place to pass. And uh, he gave me an opportunity when he went off the road and then he started leaking oil and had to pull over. So it wasn't quite, the, it looked closer from the outside than this did with Checo behind him, and for a long time it was a Ferrari chasing him. At one point it was it was even um, uh, George Russell, wasn't it? So you know, I think um, it, that's that was a slight different thing. But yes, it's nice when you've got a one-two um, in, in, to start off your season and your constructors' championship. So the team feel great. It's always a funny thing, is though, you know that it's quite difficult to get that striving emotion because when you come second or you get beaten, you so don't like it. You want to change that situation. There's a lot of motivation to change. Whereas when you win, you kind of, I know that they will be trying still very hard to find improvements and and, and gains because they'll have to. But at the same time, where's the motivation? You, You know, the only motivation is that you're going to be caught. And if they're not, if you're looking over your shoulder and you can't see anyone that's going to catch you, then you could almost go on holiday. Well, and, and the way that that RB20 looked after the soft tyre in that final stint on both cars, I thought it was really telling. The, the gap between Checo on the soft 
and, and Carlos Sainz on the hards. We were all waiting for Carlos to close and it never happened. No, even the team told him the, the, the hard tire will come alive and the soft tire will go down and nothing happened. But, well, it's promising. I say, no, Jacob have some issues. But finishing three, half a second uh, behind a, a Red Bull is not bad for Ferrari. And in the pre-test, uh, the season here, we, I, Carlos did a fantastic uh, long runs with that tire and he was perfect in, in that scenario. But I think, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I hope. What happened? What Tom, if Schultz didn't have that issue with the brakes, no? At the beginning of the race, he was pushing and um, he was ob obviously blocking and everything. But with this new rule of the second lap open, the DRS, maybe it was a little chance. But Charles was all over the place, no? I, I don't know. It's different when you lead, and Damon just explained it, when you lead and get the lead with that car. And, but if you have some trouble and somebody makes your life different, maybe it will be a, maybe the same outcome, but the race will be a little bit more entertainment. They'll be slightly crestfallen, I think, Ferrari, because I was talking to uh, uh, one of their uh, information people uh, who, who give information to the public. I won't, won't mention any names. And they were saying, yes, we're very confident of our race pace. We really think we can take the fight to, to Max. Uh, uh, it all fell apart a little bit, partly with the brake problems. But, I mean, um, Carlos got through and was charging as hard as he could and couldn't really crack them. So, Guys, let's throw it forward to just a week from now, or less than a week. We're in Saudi Arabia. The tarmac is much smoother and less abrasive. Yeah. Is that going to bring Ferrari closer to Red Bull? Well, I mean, a car that is designed for a, ch you know, a championship will work on all surfaces. You know, it's like one of those cleaning products, you know, <laughs> it cleans all surfaces. You know, it, it will, doesn't matter what, what you throw at it. It's, it's good. Sure, there's subtle differences between each track they go to. Um, we were talking to Lando and Oscar with the McLaren. They were saying that they are, they've done quite well for them here. They're not normally as competitive as they, they, their car tends not to work. It's amazing how a characteristic of a car could last for decades. But anyway, they, they're not normally as good here. They look, are looking forward to a slipperier track where they run less downforce, someone like Jeddah next week. So we'll see how they go uh, next week. And I think we should uh, give a quick word to Adrian Newey. I mean, he's there in the mix, and of course, Max has made uh, pay, take, go, taken pains to to mention that there are not. It's not just Adrian. That there's uh, there's all kinds of fantastic people are there in the team, and they haven't turned around to him and said, Adrian, listen, we're 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 paying you far too much money, and uh, we don't really need you. So do you mind leaving? Uh, they haven't said that, have they? Did you see in the test? There was a number of times where where he was lying underneath the car because I think Checo had been over a curb and you know he's still getting right in there isn't he incredible that I think is the highlight of the pre-season test now um, going down the car watching himself and always with that um, the book or the whatever how, how do you call them uh, the booklet he have all, always under the arm and observing a, every single car not only the first cars he goes down to the the grid and keeps taking notes and everything it's something amazing and and that that face when you know when he was watching max you know like wow well, what a car i i, I build and what they're a just driver dawdles we have. in there you know that they're just scribbles he, he hasn't have it he just likes to carry it to impress everyone uh it's not there's actually nothing in there you want to stop him on the grid and say come on let's take a look um do you think he'll get a quiet satisfaction that he and his team at red bull have made in a way, the Mercedes concept of the last two years work when they couldn't. Everyone in Formula One is so competitive, aren't they? I mean, absolutely. You know, you can, you can throw a set of regulations at, at Adrian and, and he will see uh, a creation within all the gaps of that regulation. OK, we want you, you know, you're going to define the height of it, the weight, the width of it, the, you know, and, and he will just somehow now, I'm giving Adrian all the credit again, but the fact of the matter is, that is that's his genius, is, is spotting where they haven't actually covered the thing that he wants to include, and they haven't prevented him from doing it. And if they've, and they tried, then he'll, he'll find a way to get to the place he wants to get to within those regulations. And, and it's, it's subtle, it takes a kind of um, 3D vision to be able to, to do that. 
and the fact that he's been in Formula One for so long and as you know, from a time when one guy would design the whole car. Does that help him now that we're in an era where everything is so much more compartmentalized? You get suspension guys who specialize in suspension. You get front wing guys who specialize on the front wing. Whereas Adrian sees the whole thing. Yes, he can make a car from, from the bottom up. I mean, he can really, he can. He, know, he understands the manufacturing process. He understands how to install and what he can, what parameters he can give to the engine manufacturer, the power unit people, because you can say, well, that's all very well, but can you please make that, um, you know, two centimeters smaller and, and weigh 10 kilos less uh, and squeeze it into this tiny little spot that I've made, I've left in the car to put on an engine. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing. He pushes people to get better and they won't want to. They won't, they will go, you know, I mean, they would, be, in the old days, you might remember that they'd, Honda would produce a V12 engine and, and they'd go, here's your engine. And everyone would look at it and go, bloody hell, it's massive. Excuse my French, sorry. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, that's massive. Um, now we've just got to make a car that can handle that much weight. You know, so he's just, he, he does the whole concept, suspension. And when he started, a bit like Gordon Murray, they had to d design a car with every, you know, they had to, with, with a pencil, draw the suspension and manage the whole design department. So you need to be able to, unite all those different departments someone needs to understand that that it's no good having the suspension people go and do their job and go oh it's not not our, it's not the suspension because we've made a great job of the suspension and they haven't talked to the aero department or they haven't talked to the engine department so or the gearbox department so it is about it's a whole thing it's a holistic thing you can't take separate out the bits they all have to make sense to the other bits for everybody even, you know, Enrique Scalabroni, he works obviously in Williams and in Ferrari. He, since 20 years ago, he's saying, he's the genius, nobody's gonna be like him ever. And you see the best engineers here, in Formula One have the best engineers, computers and everything, and he's still doing drawing in, 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 in the board and, and doing everything, the concept going through him. Incredible. Talking of that man, Adrian Newey, you're with me now, just, what an amazing day for Red Bull! Another one too. Yeah, it has. I mean, uh, you know, we, we we felt the test seemed to go well. Um, you never quite know because it's you know, fuel loads, engine modes, tire condition, time of the day. It's, it's it's quite difficult to judge it to the last little bit. And then, to be perfectly honest, through um, the first two days, we were we were struggling a little bit. We got kind of getting better by qualifying but we weren't as happy with the car as we were at the test um, and then obviously uh, today it all came together how much I don't know if paranoia is the right word but after testing when it clearly went so well what was the mood of the camp coming into this race it always has to be trepidation you know you can never take anything for granted so there's the performance side there's the reliability side there's the strategy side there's you know, there's, there's so many facets to trying to win a race, so it's you, you, you can never be complacent. You have to just try to keep pushing. And, and how much of a departure is 20 over, over 19? It looks different, but you know, from a philosophy point of view, is it, was it a step into the unknown? No, not at all. No, I mean, uh, the, the underlying architecture of the car is, is the third generation evolution of what started as RB18. Um, where we carry everything, um, apart from the radiators, they've changed, but apart from that, where we carry everything, um, the layout of the front suspension, the rear suspension, the gearbox, the casing, etc. That's just a third evolution, well, it's a third evolution of, of RB18. Um, the, the bits that are visible, uh, and have obviously caused quite a lot of attention, obviously we're pursuing aerodynamic gains there, but the, the, the visual change is actually much, much larger than the performance change you get from that. And there are other much more subtle bits that, that people haven't noticed that are probably responsible for a bigger gain. And you said that you started the Grand Prix weekend, it wasn't that smooth. So when you were putting the soft tyre on for that last stint, were you nervous, particularly with Checo, with Carlos only a couple of seconds back? Well, like all of us, we, we all teams and we kind of tried to do our homework and came to the conclusion that we felt with our car that 
it was best suited to one hard and two softs. Um, most other teams felt their car was better suited to two hards and one soft. And of course, when you we had to make that decision really on on Wednesday evening after FP2 um, because that sets what tyres you use in FP3. So we burnt a set of hards in FP3 um, to allow us to then carry a new set of softs into the race, and that, that's what we did. Damon just described your cars as cleaning products, didn't he, Juan? He said they work on all surfaces. <laughs> <laughs> that's very kind. It was a nice word, <laughs> descriptive. That's what we've tried to achieve. We've tried to achieve is, is a car that is reasonably well suited to all circuits. I think typically last year are the circuits that we had less of an advantage on were the, the, the maximum downforce street tracks. Um, Singapore obviously we made, famously made a bit of a, a mess of. Um, underperformed to, to what we could have achieved. I think we could have certainly achieved podiums there could we got our act together a bit better. But it is certainly true to say that those circuits are the ones that we probably have less advantage on. But as long as we're not disastrous on them, then then that maybe that's good enough. And also, you never leave any details unattended because Damon and us, uh, uh, and me were surprised about you going down the the car of Checo to check what happened with a drained cover. It's always like that. You are in everything. Well, yeah, everybody is. But all right, we try to encourage that sort of spirit within the team that everybody should be curious to keep their eyes open um, and not necessarily be pigeonholed into just looking at one small area but try to have a bit of a holistic approach and and, uh, and so we, we have a very open policy within the team that we don't keep secrets between departments or anything like that and, and personally I think that helps to keep feeling people feeling kind of involved and, and motivated and, and um, fresh. Adrian, it's a sensational start to the year. Very well done to you and the team. Thank you very much. No, it's the, the guys back in uh, Milton Keynes, they've, they don't get the television coverage, unfortunately, but, but um, they've really done an amazing job over the winter. This is an advertisement from BetterHelp. Picture this. You wake up tomorrow and magically you've got an extra hour in your day. How would you choose to spend that time? Would you go for a run? Dive into that book you've been putting off, or maybe just take a much-needed nap. We spend so much of our lives wishing for more time. But time for what exactly? That's the ultimate question. And that's where therapy can help. There's a big misconception that therapy is all about fixing problems. But it's also about taking time to understand what truly matters to you and making it a priority. Because therapy isn't just for when things are falling apart. It's for everyone. Whether you're dealing with major trauma or just trying to navigate life's everyday challenges, therapy can make a world of difference. And with better help, you can learn positive coping skills, how to set boundaries and become the best version of yourself. So why not make time for what matters most? Start your journey today. You won't regret it. And with over 1,000 therapists in the UK already, BetterHelp can provide access to mental health professionals with a wide variety of expertise in mental health. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash F1 Nation. That's betterhelp.com slash F1 Nation. That's a late lunge and a half, my word, from downtown to take the place of Carlos Sainz. He came from another postcode. I love it. I love it. I love to see drivers having the confidence to send it on the brakes. And if you want to win races and you want to win championships, you've got to have that kind of bravery. He's got a bit between his teeth. He's got all the racing cliches that you want. But either way, he is driving in a way that we've never seen from him before. It's been the Charles Leclerc show in the past. That is a rocket ship move. Say goodbye to Carlos Sainz because he's going to go and chase the Red Bulls. Carlos, coming to you now. Uh, fourth in the opening race last year, third this year. Given everything that's happened to you over the winter, just how important is this podium? I think it's just important to start the season well, uh, start the season with a strong race, just not, not for my future, just for myself, you know, because last year I spent 
a lot of the races, you know, looking in my mirror, saving tires, defending my position. And I remember at the Carlon saying, yeah, this year I wish we had a car to to go racing, you know, and, and attack people and don't care too much about the tires and and uh, make some overtaking moves and look forward rather than look backwards. And it's exactly what we got, you know. I, I got an attacking race, uh, really good race pace. And from there, uh, everything felt uh, really good to finish P3. It wasn't a, a straightforward and an easy race, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Tell us more about those overtakes and specifically the ones on Charles Leclerc, because from outside the car, it looked very close. How did they feel inside the car? It never felt close inside the car. Uh, whenever I do a overtake on my teammate, I will always try and leave as much margin as possible. And I try and do it whenever I feel like I'm fully under control and I'm not putting any car at risk. And uh, that's exactly what I did. Uh, I felt like a, a very good moves uh, and always uh, keeping an eye on, on Charles and, and not making him also lose time or anything like that. And just give us your thoughts on that final stint. What were you feeling at that moment in the race? Did you think P2 was on? You guys need to consider that we've been testing here three days and I've been seeing that Red Bull degradation on soft and it's exactly the same as ours on the hard. So as soon as I knew Red Bull had a new soft to, for the last stint and Checo had it, it's not like I went, OK, this is my chance. But uh, I knew the Red Bulls today were going to be very, very difficult to beat. So to keep up with one of them and, and have the possibility to, to fight the... It's already a good surprise. I think we're one of, at one of their strongest tracks of the season with very high tire deck at the rear. Hopefully when we go to a more front limited track and better tarmac, uh, our car will come alive and we will be able to mount a, a better challenge on, on Max for the win. So Carlos Sainz saying they knew Red Bull were going to be hard to beat. Did he expect the gap to be that big one? Um, Carlos was a little bit surprised about the gap. Especially, obviously, with Max, not with Checo. He was very close and fighting with a Red Bull. That The highlight for him was at least trying to catch up a, a one Red Bull. Um, but he was more happy about the performance of the car compared to last year. And saying that the car at least does what they want, not whatever the car wants. And uh, I think he did a great, great job today. No? He was very calm. At some point, we said, OK, we have again Monza, no, between Charles and I and thought him. it felt like that. He actually said, "No, no, no, it, it wasn't close at all no, on no, track." But, but from I the outside, maybe, yeah. yeah, maybe. But it was was well managed. And after that, obviously, with a little issue that Charles had, I think uh, he did a great, great job. He better than that, impossible. I mean, driving point. I don't know if Damon agrees, but he extract everything from that SF uh, twenty four. But I think it started much better than last year's car, and maybe they have that room to improve. Um, yeah, I think he was very, very happy. I, I can have the body language of the drivers. I know them very well because of the pen and all the interviews. And he was very, very satisfied. How important was it for Carlos to put in a performance like that, given the winter he's had, the unsettling winter he's had? Very important. You know, he's fighting to show that he's a commodity, he's a guy you'd like to have in your car at the sharp end um, and there's a couple of places he wants to go I would say that probably I don't know if Red Bull is, is on his list he's obviously qualified as a Red Bull driver originally but uh, you know if Checo leaves there may be a seat there or you know, but would it be the right thing to do would would Mercedes be the right place to go would it be I mean there there is the the problem with the fact that he's a you're swapping drivers uh, from Ferrari to Mercedes and Mercedes would have to explain why they were taking a driver that has been thrown out in favour of the driver that they already had at Mercedes. Um, so, um, so, but I think that he's, when they, when are they, what they're after at Mercedes is someone who can deliver at the sharp end in Formula 1 and he's, he can do that and also he's driven for a very big team in Ferrari so he understands all those pressures. If you promote a young driver they've got to, quite, they've got to learn about the team they've got to learn about Formula 1 you can see Oscar with his enormous talent you know he's still learning um, and I think that C Carlos would be a, a strong candidate for that that place at, at Mercedes you put Fernando in you don't know how many more years he's going to go on for I mean he even, he even started off the weekend saying I don't know if I'll, I'll make my mind up in the next three weeks 
He said men he mentioned weeks, didn't he, or three races or something. Shoots pretty soon. He's going to decide whether he's going to carry on or not because he didn't exactly say he's getting tired. But you know, he 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 sort of alluded to the fact that this takes a lot out of you every year going racing. Now, the pit stops at Ferrari were very good, very slick today. But I felt a there were the reliability issues. Both drivers complaining of brake issues, obviously affecting Charles more than Carlos. But also, there was that odd moment in qualifying in Q1 when they sent Charles out on the, a new set of softs that then compromised him going forward. And this worries me. I mean, I, I, I see this a lot from Ferrari, and I think that Charles, Charles has to take control of this. It seems to me like this is where Carlos is, seems to me a little bit more savvy. Uh, in that he's aware of what's going on and he takes responsibility for things and, and, and challenges the team, whereas Charles seems to be waiting for it to be served up. You know, they, and then when they serve up the wrong thing, he, all he can do is say, oh, you served up the wrong thing, and, but uh, you know, his loyalty to the team is such that he doesn't want to criticise them. Yeah, I agree, because even he said on the radio, I don't agree with this, he went out and I think he jeopardy, well, because he told us with that, that scrub tire and the first out in Q3, when they put the new tires, the balance was completely different. And he was the fastest guy on the weekend, no? because in Q2 he was the best time even that Max Pohl. And I think that that decision uh, was bad for Charles, no? for the confidence. And uh, it's always sometimes with Charles. No? I remember when they put the, in Brazil the... Uh, inter tires or rain tires and everybody was with slicks and it always comes to I agree with Damon no? I say no no let's do this or so, like George you no know, first year in, in Mercedes like giving a little bit of, on the team and Charles maybe in that sense it's a little bit more I don't know he's he come down because first year with Sebastian was terrible no and the radio message and doing things as, as he wanted but now it looks like he completely obeyed the team and I think it's okay, but... Why does he not take control of the situation? Because when you talk to him, he understands strategy. He understands, he, he's able to look at a race as a whole. So why does he let it happen? Is it is it a character flaw that he's just not... What would you say then? I think he's very polite. I mean, you, <laughs> no, but is that the thing? He is very polite, not a person. I don't think he's a... There's a polite way of saying no. Yeah, I think they have to be firm. I mean, you know, there's the other end of the scare, which is Max, who gives uh, GP. He gives him absolute hell, but he's pumped up. Anyway, whatever. There's different ways to get your message across. Um, and I think Carlos, in Ferrari, Carlos seems to be confident and sure that he's got his own plan he wants to implement and he's happy to challenge Ferrari with uh, with Charles it's almost like they've got this protective ring around him and they and they and they don't really Charles doesn't actually un, hasn't actually twigged that actually he needs to be driving this you know all the great drivers took control of the team and made the team work for them and, and he's gonna have to do that in 2025 because Lewis will certainly take control won't he uh, Let's look down the road, guys. Do we think Ferrari will win more races this year than they did in 2023? You know, that's that sole victory for Carlos Sainz in Singapore. Do we think they're going to be a more consistent threat from what we've seen in testing and at this first race? Uh, maybe, yeah. And racetracks like uh, Baku or Monaco, they are very good in slow, in slow speed corners. We, we Faster than Red Bull, at least in, in this kind of track. And and the tracks are where Charles Leclerc feels very confident. You know, this is one of Charles' favorite tracks also. But in Baku, Monaco, I, I think they have a little chance uh, to win more races that, than last year. Because if they are happier from with this new car than they were last year, and they were able at least to win a race, um, I think uh, yeah. But never we never know the how do you say the the roof that <laughs> Red Bull have. Maybe this new concept gives them more advantage or maybe not and the other ones that copy the concept of Red Bull can extract more of them difficult but not impossible but maybe it's more a hope than a reality and I think uh, everybody wants at least uh, Ferrari or another team you know we never expect that uh, they're gonna win with a W13 and they did it in Brazil no and there was a, a very good win and after that 
they never won a race, but Lewis had a pole in, in a racetrack that he loves, like uh, like in Hungary ring. And I don't know, I think uh, we're going to have some surprises. Well, look, let's move it on to Mercedes, guys. I mean, Russell P5, Lewis P7. Um, I thought they surprised us in qualifying, particularly George Russell, but they also surprised us in the race from their lack of pace. Yeah, George had a, a list of problems that he was explaining. Uh, yeah, all sorts of problems, like breaking overheat and, and uh, having to, yeah, having to wind back. He couldn't charge up his battery. He just went on and on. I mean, so that, you know, he didn't do too bad at considering all those problems. And Lewis uh, reckoned his setup was was not suited for qualifying and that's that but that really hurt him in the race because actually they didn't have enough pace to to tackle the mclarens and uh you know they, they he couldn't quite get past lando and and get himself further up and um so, so so the mood of george russell after the race was probably quite positive then i've still finished p5 and qualified p3 and despite having all these problems possibly i think that they they might look at it as they've got more pace and they could they could exploit this weekend um, and that if they fix those problems then they'll be they'll be up there with Ferrari but um, you'd have to say Ferrari are looking stronger right now yeah because well Lewis has an issue also with the seat and he's told us that in, when he was braking the seat was moving and also had to do a, a lot of change-ups and setups because of maybe the same issue that have uh, George with lack of um, you know, ref refrigeration in the car, <laughs> and uh, and that have to cool down a little bit because they have the same warning in in the in the display that it was overheating the engine. Not in the case of Lewis, but yes, George. But considering that Lewis started ninth and finished seventh, just closing up a little bit on Lando Norris, and just one position, two positions behind his teammate, he started. Third, I think uh, he was extremely, I never see him in, with that performance happy, you know, and he went in the pen and smiling and very talking a lot. You know, Lewis, when he don't have a good race, yeah, he just we, we hardly, know about it. <laughs> <laughs> hardly he can say a couple of words. In this case, he explained a lot and he said he have uh, some hope for the next races, you know, because this car is much better than last year. And George too. Let's see. We, it's going to be a, a, a nice fight to watch Lewis and George maybe he was looking at the pace of a Ferrari and <laughs> chuckling to himself um, but um, yeah it's been a, it's been a good start to the season I mean we'd like to have seen a much tighter race at the front so there's a lot of work to do for the other teams to close that battle but, but Damon I feel Lewis the demeanor of Lewis Hamilton this weekend has been a bit different in that he spent more time in the paddock just hanging out he's sort of it's almost like he's trying he said to himself, I am going to enjoy this last season at Mercedes and I'm going to chat to people in the paddock and just hang out a bit. And I'm going to, OK, I'm going to qualify ninth because I've got the wrong setup on my car, but I'm not going to get down about it. And I'm going to have a... Do you remember when he'd sewn up the championship, beat Nico and then Nico won the next, whatever, how many it was, three races and then won the championship the following year? You know, he, he, you cannot afford to back off too much I think you know it's Lewis has got an abundance of talent he could probably you know turn it on when he wants to whenever he wants to uh, it'll it'll always be there but it won't <laughs> that's the problem it won't always be there because he's getting on a bit and so you know there, there is an element of I hope he doesn't slack off too much this year he needs to he needs to really this year establish everything about him. you know if there's opportunities and I know he'll do it but if he needs to not get out qualified by George every race. He needs to get up there and get the best results for Mercedes and then leave with a spring in his step. Um, and so the, the, cha the, the, the challenge is still there. He might have been coming here quite relaxed. And it, but he does tend to start a season quite relaxed and then he just turns it up. As and the starts, season goes on. So yeah, after the summer break, he comes back a little yeah, bit more exactly. angry. <laughs> and the poor old teammates get ground into the dirt. So we'll see. Tom, I have to shoot aeroplanes to catch uh, it's been great chatting on the f1 nation again this is a brilliant first race i wish it was a bit warmer um but um i have to i have to get up get back and and i'm not going to jetta so uh enjoy that one but i'll be you'll see me in australia 
So, Juan, the champ's gone. <laughs> what do you make of McLaren? I mean, the first time they've scored points in the opening race since 2021. And as the driver said, the, this track is not their favorite track for them. Even the owners of the team, most of the, owners, the shareholders of the team are from Bahrain. But I think they were very happy with this start of the season compared to last year. I think last year was very bad for McLaren and they anticipated before the, even the season, the, the season started, sorry. Because I'm just I say, you know, we have a lot of work to do and they did a great job after the, the summer break and they were one of the teams that scored more points. And they, if they have this start like this, if they can perform like they did last year, I mean, with upgrades and going faster and faster, I think we have a, a very good team and two great drivers, no? Certainly two great drivers. I don't think they can bank on making the same progress this year that they did last year. Because that was incredible what we saw from Austria onwards, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they're going to have that big, big advantage because maybe if they do that with a good start, they will be faster than the Red Bulls. That Well, that's the aim, obviously, for every single team. But I think it's, it's a good starting point. And uh, if they can't keep up with... Uh, because Mercedes is going to be strong, I think, I'm sure, because they show up a little bit. Maybe they, as we mentioned before, they, they have some issues with with some problems, but um, I think if they can cope with the upgrades and every single piece they put in the car and goes in the right direction, like Red Bull does, <laughs> like Adrian Newey does, they don't never make a mistake, um, it will be uh, one of the teams to, to fight at least for a win, no, like they did in Qatar with a sprint race with Paul and win from Oscar. We don't know which driver will bring the win. There's one interesting thing with Norris in that he didn't get the maximum out of the car in qualifying again. And we saw that a lot in the second half of last year because he's such a good driver. Yeah, you mentioned Qatar and it, that's why I thought of it because Qatar was one of the instances where he made a mistake in Q3 and he did the same here. And it's his, he, at least he's sincere. Like he said, okay, it's my fault. The car is fantastic. I am the bad driver, maybe exaggerating. But yeah, yesterday in the first sector, he, he blew it up. And he mentioned that without that mistake, maybe he was for P2. It's kind of, um, of sometimes Charles or even George, like today he did a little mistake. And, and uh, they're young drivers with experience, but they still, I love to develop and sometimes the car doesn't help. No, it's not like Max is a mega star, but also the car is a mega star. But um, I think Lando will, will get it. Of course he will. He's too good not to. But it just, it's interesting that it's sort of carried on in that similar vein at this first race. So throttle it back. Almost need to take one step back to then progress. Don't you? It happens so often in life. But what about Aston Martin then? Because Alonso was cock a hoop after qualifying. Did, wasn't he? he? He was so pleased. He thought he'd outperformed the car to be P6. And then I was surprised. I thought their race pace would be better. Yeah, and he, he was not in the same mood like yesterday. No, obviously, because yesterday he was encouraging and saying, OK, wow, where we are. And, and then he thought in the race they will be much better than the reality. Because yesterday he was even thinking of going forward, not backwards. And... And then he said, OK, we are the fifth team, you know, and if we are the fifth team, we have to be ninth and tenth, how we did. And I think he lifted a little bit that motion <laughs> because um, I told him, I, I, sorry, I asked him if uh, last year they started very well and then they went a little bit down. If this can, occasion can be like McLaren we were talking about. If they start in this point and they can go up. And he say, yeah, maybe it's the case because this, ha this car has potential. Much more room to improve. The other one maybe start very, very, um, very fast. And then would, we, we make some upgrades that didn't work and we lost a little bit the, the ground. And I think if is that the case, a McLaren case, maybe Aston Martin will be also by mid-season or after the summer break uh, fighting for, for that 33 win that he <laughs> it's a little bit on not in the in the best moment now can you explain one thing to me uh 
I saw Lance Stroll at the back on lap one after being after he was tagged by Nico Hulkenberg, and he then turned up in P10 at the flag. How did he do that? I, I <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, he was out of sequence, you know, with the, the strategy, and uh, maybe that helped him in in some part of the of the race because with it he had to stop earlier, and he was building up with good speed until one point. Obviously, Fernando with better tires, he overtook him, but it's not a big change for the team, 9 or 10, whatever driver it is. But I think he did a very good race, like he did last year. For me, one of the best races for Lance Stroll was last year, at this time, with a broken wrist, suffering and even fighting for big points. And um, that's why, I mean, maybe also this track and the motivation. I don't know what's it's missing on Lance, maybe to, to be a little bit closer in, in qualifying to, to Fernando, because sometimes he is. And then in the moment he have to perform, like in Q2 or Q3, he, he, he lose a little bit, but well, it's against one of the greatest. That was going to be my offering to this bit of the conversation is that he is, you are comparing him to one of the greatest. Um, if we now look at what I call any other business, um, what stood out for you this weekend when we look at the other teams? Alpine. Wow, it's been a very difficult weekend and pre-test for, for them. Um, I hope they have the chance to, to with upgrades. Ocon was a, quite a, was good from him, to, from Stevan, at one point in the radio saying, okay, doesn't matter, this, it does, it's, not, it's not the end of the war, we're gonna uh, bounce back, we, we, we have to fight. And encouraging the team. By the other side, Pierre may be a little bit more upset because they were almost the last team and, and uh, that's why it's weird because they were, if we go two years ago, they were maybe with Fernando, they, they were fighting for podiums. Remember with seven, they won a race. And uh, I think the, with all the changes, with Otmars of now are leaving the team and with Bruno Faman like getting on charge, it was big changes and maybe that take time in the process that you have to build a car from, from this year. And maybe that affects that development from from this 2024 car if you see it it's not a car that you say wow what a what lines or even surprise you but i don't know a lot of um people believing that it's up to 10 kilos that alone is 0.3 every lap and then they hold their hand up and say that the power unit you know is the least powerful on the grid they admit that so the combination of everything is just adding up and it's going to be a long season, I feel, particularly as this is a sort of two year campaign, because when the 2026 aero regs open up on the 1st of January 2025, if you want to hit the ground running in 26, you're going to have to focus the wind tunnel on 2026. Yeah. So what does Alpine do? They've got to they've got to progress really quickly with this car. Yeah, they have to get all the resources for the for the new rules in 2026. If they can, I think they have the the team and the, and the engineers to, to do a you know, turnover, uh, try to, to be better. It's, they're not going to be fighting for podiums, I think. It's maybe uh, not in the short term, maybe in the long term, maybe they can do it. But well, it must be for frustrating for, for both drivers and also for the team. Well, Juan, I feel we've almost reached the end of the show. Uh, if I say the words Nico Hulkenberg to you, well, Nico, incredible, no? Because last year he per he qualified tenth. After being out of Formula One for three years, even he had five races, or he was the the perfect reserve driver for all the teams. Not only for <laughs> he, he was the driver who everybody wants to have in the team, and he was so enthusiastic and happy to be back in Formula One with a seat for whole for the whole year, and. He qualified here tenth, and he ran uh, over Lance, no, and he was maybe a little bit optimistic in that situation. But he had to try, no, yeah. because it was a good starting point, tenth. And yesterday we were commentating, and I was sitting next to Gunter Steiner, and when he qualified, Nico qualified for tenth, I say to him, "Wow." What do you think about this? He say he, he did the same last year. He like a lot the the track, and he's he feels very comfortable in this track, and that's why I mean it was a good performance. I hope that Has can, can keep with that 
improving the race pace because at one lap there they were always there. But what about your driver of the day? We didn't manage to ask Damon because he had to run for the plane, but who would you say? Well, I have to go to with the obvious because Max did everything perfect. Uh, I know, but he had the same car that Checo have. I mean, I can agree with Carlos because he had a very, as I mentioned at the first, when we talk about Ferrari, and he have a very, very intelligent race, good pace, he makes the right moves, he, he great overtakes. I mean, he deserve it. And we know that people picks the driver of the day, well, let's you know, pick a, a, a Max again. But if you go to the reality, Max didn't put a feet wrong, the team also with great stop, a big advantage over Checo, even Checo have some issues. And for me, it will be Max Verstappen. Very interesting what you're saying about Carlos, because I love the way you use the word intelligent, because we don't have to look too far back to Singapore. It's one of the best performance when we were realized in, in the transmission that he was giving the DRS on purpose. I mean, even the team was asking him, watch out, yeah, yeah, I, I've got this, I've got this. He got it. I think if I were Mercedes or Red Bull or any, any team that has a potential space, you have to consider Carlos Sainz because I think he's grown as a driver in the last 12 months hugely. Because remember last year, no? It was the second year in Ferrari. Charles, we know that it's the driver with more poles and less wins, maybe. <laughs> and uh, he's so fast at one lap. And he always was two, three tenths. Um, and he, start, he told me once, I know where I have to work to close the gap with Charles. I know the re direction I have to take. And he did it. And yeah. he, he stick on that direction and he close up and even beat him in, in pole, with pole positions and in a race, the only driver to win a race. And I think he's a very smart driver. And if I am a team principal, of course, I will, with all the drivers we have, maybe available because there's a lot of them without a contract, I will pick up Carlos' father phone first and, uh, and, <laughs> and chat with, with Junior because it's the driver to, to fill the seat. It's a chance, I don't know, Red Bull or, or whatever also, because remember they started together with Max and they were very close. Um, I will call Carlos. Yeah. Well, Max is your driver of the day. Carlos is mine. And I'm going to give a mention in dispatches to Lance Stroll. Because, again, I still haven't quite worked out how he got from 20th on lap one yeah. to yeah. In, in a, on a track where, you know, there were zero retirements. It was a phenomenal yeah, yeah. performance by him. So well done, Lance. Well done to Max. Well done to Carlos Sainz and everybody else. So the top 10 looked like this. Max Verstappen took win number 55 and his second consecutive victory here at the Bahrain International Circuit. Sergio Perez was second and Carlos Sainz third. Then came Charles Leclerc with his brake problems in P4. George Russell was fifth with his power unit problems and Lando Norris sixth in the lead McLaren. In seventh was Lewis Hamilton who had battery issues. Then in eighth was Oscar Piastri. Ninth was the lead Aston Martin of Fernando Alonso. And in 10th, having come up from last on lap one, Lance Stroll. The Drivers' Championship is, of course, the same as the top 10 finishing positions in the race. In the Constructors' Championship, Red Bull Racing already have 44 points at the top of the table. That was good enough for a P7 finish in 2023. Ferrari are second on 27 points, with Mercedes third on 16. In fourth come McLaren on 12, and Aston Martin are the last team with points at this stage, with three. And then, of course, in order, we have Sauber 6th, Haas 7th, RB 8th, Williams 9th and Alpine 10th. So thanks very much again to Damon and to Juan. And of course, we will be back with our review of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix when F1 Academy will be getting underway as well. That's all next Monday. And remember, you can still get your tickets for the early races of the 2024 season, including the race in Jeddah on Saturday and in Australia two weeks after that. Just go to tickets.formula1.com. And why not check out F1 Beyond the Grid this week, where my guest is RB team principal, Laurent Mekies. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. F1 Nation is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios.
Formula One is the greatest sport in the world. But there can be a lot to understand. Don't worry, we're here to help. I'm Katie Osborne. This is Christian Hugill. And welcome to F1 Explains. This is the official F1 podcast about how the sport really works. The drivers, the cars, the rules, the words, the risk takers, late breakers, and history makers that amaze and inspire us every race weekend. Hit like, follow, or subscribe for new episodes every Friday as we answer your questions about F1 with the help of some very special guests. Oscar Piastri, welcome for your debut on F1 Explains. Thank you, thanks for having me. Double World Champion Mika Hakkinen, welcome to F1 Explains. That they could make up, what the, what are you doing, man? <laughs> what, are, what are you doing? And by your side, a woman whose race strategy once made Sergio Perez cry. Guys. It's important for me to say tears of joy. Welcome back, Bernie Collins. Thank you so much. You've just not heard the crying ones from Lewis from the race. <laughs> Susie Wolf joining us here on F1 Explains. What a joy to have you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me, Christian Hugill and Katie Osborne on the stage is Formula One legend David Coulthard. We'll be here across the 2024 season with current drivers and legends of the sport. Plus, insights and explanations from people you don't usually get to hear from, the unseen experts who are essential to Formula One. We need your question to put to our experts. Are you F1 Explains? <laughs> we are. I love your podcast. I love F1 Explains. <laughs> Christian Hugo. Hugo. Oh my God. And Katie Osborne. Katie Osborne. Record it as a voice note on your phone, or you can write it in an email and send it to F1Explains at F1.com. Just search for F1Explains wherever you get your podcasts, and we'll speak to you soon.